Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. In the early days of the public health crisis we now know as COVID, COVID-19, we called it the novel coronavirus. There is not much novel about it now. We are well months, in fact, into this public health crisis that has affected almost every aspect of life. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running program on Carolina business policy and public affairs. In a moment, we start this week's dialogue with our leadership from here across the Carolinas. And later on, he is the chairman and CEO of Martin Marietta Materials, but also the chairman of the North Carolina Chamber. Ward Nye joins us again to start unpacking large construction, but also the impact of workers, COVID, and all things related. We hope you'll stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Joe Waters of Capita, Randall Johnson from the North Carolina Biotechnology Center in Wilmington, and special guest Ward Nye, Chairman and CEO of Martin Marietta and Chairman of the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce. Welcome again to our dialogue. Good to have you both here. Joe, welcome. Randall, welcome. I'm glad to see you're both very, uh, at least seem to be safe, um, cocooned where you might be. Joe, I'll, I want to start with you, the idea that we've been in such a defensive mode since the public health crisis broke in, in Q1. How do we go from this, and I don't want to get too existential here, but how do we go from the psychology of scarcity to the psychology of abundance? How do we get that confidence back? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me back on the show. I think one of the great opportunities that we have right now in the, the months and years ahead is bold, persistent, tenacious experimentation and innovation. This has been a tremendous disruption in our national and, frankly, global lives. And I've been reading a lot about the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal during this time. And, and, and Roosevelt had this line, bold, persistent, tenacious experimentation. It's what we need. It's, it's what we need to innovate, uh, to be creative, to find creative solutions, to rebuild the social contract and the social systems that can support people. And of course, importantly, to rebuild our economy and to get people back to work. So I, this has been a terrible year for so many people, but I'm hopeful that we can turn a quarter into 2021 if we remain with our eye on the ball, that there is opportunity ahead. Randall, so no, there's no disrespect in the way I'm going to ask this question. I don't want to qualify it too much, but the idea that you, you are part of the economic development structure in North Carolina and people will expect economic developers to sound, to sound optimistic, to sound boosters. But what is the real, what is the, the, the way to get back to the confidence as Joe just talked about it and we asked about the idea of going from this idea of, of, of a dearth to abundance? Well, I, I don't want to diminish the suffering that many people and businesses and industries in our state are seeing right now. Uh, however, I will point to some bright spots. Uh, we are an optimistic bunch in the economic development community, and we need to continue to focus on how to alleviate that suffering over uh, the next year, two years. I will point to the bright spots of life sciences. We continue to see 
announcements and uh, uh, efforts around COVID related to treatment, uh, prevention, et cetera. We continue to see announcements too at the state level from NC Commerce and EDPNC related to jobs in rural areas, investments in rural areas. So we need to, as, as Joe mentioned, look at this as a monumental opportunity to change the way we look at economic development in many parts of our society and, and the way we do things. But I will point to the fact that there are some bright spots and some foundation to build on. Mm -hmm. The second thing to think about, I think, is the fact that even after COVID, a lot of the foundational components of North Carolina's attractiveness to people in the state and outside the state are going to remain. So we have a lot of a lot to build on as we come out of the pandemic. I do think, though, that this is a great opportunity to review how we do things and improve always continuous improvement uh, mentality. Joe, do you get that same sense of optimism in the Palmetto State? As, as Randall just described North Carolina, does South Carolina come in that way? Yeah, I, 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 I think so, for sure. But I, I would point to one thing that's really keeping me up at night, Chris, and that is the fact that we have women in particular leaving the workforce in droves mm -hmm. due to childcare responsibilities that have to do with, of course, schools being out and childcare across for younger children across both states being closed. And so while there is certainly optimism, I think across the Carolinas, there's also a realism that we have got to get past whatever political hangups we have in both states. And obviously South Carolina has been different in how it's handled the pandemic than North Carolina, so that we can get all schools reopened, we can get kids back in school so that parents, in particular women, can get back to work. We're seeing tremendous falling behind uh, of women in the workforce, and that, I think that's a long-term concern for both states. Well, one of the things that's, that seemingly has been the same in the Carolinas has been the idea of those, is the unemployment rate had spiked since early March when the pandemic uh, clearly was taking hold, and now it's diminished to some degree. There's, it's still historically a large number of people unemployed and some have even left the workforce. But Randall, back to the idea of finding, of connecting those that are looking for a job with the jobs available, there still is a lot of question. People looking to hire talent still can't find the talent that they need. That's a little antithetical, isn't it? It is, and it's one of the biggest issues I think we face as a state from an economic developer perspective, the misalignment between talent and skills and the available jobs that are there now, as well as the ones we expect to see in the future. I think there are organizations like uh, the community college system and their apprenticeship program, they're trying to answer that question and doing a great job in that area. My Future NC has that as one of their primary uh, goals is to align the jobs with the talent. And I think going forward, uh, that's gonna be, continue to be one of our biggest issues for a while. Uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but at one point, North Carolina had the most open available jobs of any state in the nation at the same time that we had a, a relatively high employment, unemployment rate. So, so it's not just economic development. Joe, I want to go back to you. It's uh, the pipeline in the education process, including K through 12. Um, there's been a lot of consternation, a lot of concern about the lost educational attainment is the term that one particular board of education chair told me. Is, of course, that's a concern. How much of a concern is the students' lost educational attainment this year if everyone is facing the same challenge? Well, Chris, I think realistically, we are dealing with a tremendous negative generational impact, not only from lost learning, but from uh, lost social connections, from lost social and emotional learning, which I know Randall will tell you are so critical, right, uh, for, for employers. That's what employers are, are looking for. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is really a, a, a generational crisis, frankly, for the kids who are school age uh, right now. And I am just in a position now where, where I think we have to go back to basics. Children need to be in responsive, reciprocal relationships with loving and devoted adults who want to care for them and teach them. And while I think this in many respects needs to be a year in which parents give themselves a little bit of a break, give their kids a break, teachers give themselves a break, 
let's go back to the principles, to the core principles that kids need to be in relationships with adults who care for them and who love them and who want to teach them. And while, you know, it, we might not get all the math done this year that we would have hoped for these kids, those relationships are really going to be critical. And that's going to be the buffer for those kids in the midst of this great stress that is created by the pandemic and the economic dislocation associated with it. Randall, this is probably not fair, but in 30 seconds, can you summarize this, the, the thoughts in a different way? I have a six-year-old son, and we're facing those same issues daily. Uh, my wife and I are somewhat frustrated with the uh, state of, of education right now. I, I hope that it's not a generational deficit that we see from this short-term issue. Uh, I hope that it's something that we can overcome. But to your point, Joe, this is the time, especially for kids my son's age and, and around uh, first to third and fifth grade, it's the sponge time for them. It's when they take everything in and learn so much and, and they're going to miss at least a, a year, year and a half of that type of close experience with a teacher, which I agree they need. The relationship component of the pandemic is one of the, the most damaging, I think, not only for kids and children in an educational setting, but also for people in business um, economic development, certainly, uh, education at all levels. So the relationship component is key. I do think that, uh, to your point about experimentation earlier, Joe, we are in an experimental time. And I think folks are doing the best they can to try to figure out the right path. Right. I think most people agree that kids need to be in school, but is it safe? And, and that's the balance that we have to strike. So uh, to summarize, I hope this is not such a long-term deficit that we see from the, the short-term pandemic. Okay. There's an old saying, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Our next guest is falls squarely into that category, not just busy now, but tends to be pretty committed. He is the chairman and chief executive officer of the large aggregate material company, Martin Marietta, but he's also the chairman of the North Carolina Chamber, the co-chair of NC First, among many other responsibilities and commitments. We welcome back to the dialogue, Ward Nye. Ward, nice to see you, sir. William, it is great to be with you. It's always great to be on your show. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, at the top of the program, it is appropriate. And uh, we need to completely disclaim and disclose that Martin Marietta has been and continues to be an underwriter for this dialogue, Carolina Business Review. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me, let me start with one of the most obvious things that I know faces you in your, in your day job, commercial construction. Wow. Could it be better? Has it been better? And how do you plan for down the road when it's maybe not quite as strong or robust? Well, it, it's been awfully good for the last couple of years. It's going to be interesting to see what it looks like going forward. Because if you think about the way our business works, at least in North Carolina, the biggest piece of it tends to be infrastructure, then non-res, to your point, and mm -hmm. then residential. What we're seeing right now is not a big surprise, and it's something that we indicated at half year that we would see, and that is a slowing in non-res but you're seeing a slowing in different components of non-res. So are we seeing office buildings slow? Yeah, we are. Is, is hospitality slowing? It is. But Chris, if you look at the heavy side of it, it's not slowing that much. So is Amazon putting in new distribution facilities across North Carolina and across the United States? They are. So it, it, it's a bit of a bifurcation between what's happening on the light side of non-res and what's happening on the heavy side right now. So we, we think that that's going to be that way probably through about half year next year, if, if we have our uh, barometer on it correctly. When, when uh, just one more, uh, unpack that a little bit more. How, how do you plan for, clearly the disruption has been, and not to be insensitive to, to use a term you used earlier, Randall, but how do you plan for a disruption that's been positive for the bottom line and the top line of Mark Marietta, but going forward, um, there could be unintended consequences. How do you look around a corner and make sure that you're ready for that? You know, part of what we've been focused on, Chris, and, and we've done it through the first half of the year, we've been focused on our employees, our customers, our shareholder, and their cumulative safety. So part of what I'm, I'm pleased to say, we had this, the most profitable first half in Martin Marietta's history. We also had the safest first half in Martin Marietta's history. And I, I think those two things go hand in hand. But as we're looking at what the next several years are going to be, what's important to remember, Chris, is the economic cycle that ended with COVID was actually not a construction-led recovery in the United States. So 
if we're looking at residential housing starts today at about 1.2 million, remember a 50 year average is 1.5 million. We just had the highway bill expire by its own terms as of September 30th, but equally we've got a continuing resolution that's in place for a year. And at least if we're listening to the people running for president today, they act as if infrastructure is going to be something that's important to them early on. So if we're looking at where we've been, we've actually been navigating through something from our industry's perspective that hasn't been particularly buoyant. And we actually believe construction, particularly on the public side, could be important to help hold not just the North Carolina economy, but the national economy out of something that we think is going to be challenging for a while. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah, Ward, thank you. I, I'm, I'm curious just to understand a little bit more about how your workforce has managed through this pandemic, not just uh, the safety, which you mentioned, and congratulations on having such a good year so far as far as safety goes, but in terms of getting to work, uh, doing, doing the job, having, having uh, the, the capacity to get, drop their kids off at school and that sort of thing. Well, we, we've dealt with it in two very distinct ways. So, Joe, if you went to one of our operations today, you would think, well, this looks remarkably like it looked before COVID hit. Now, keep in mind, if we're operating quarries in the United States, they're naturally socially distancing jobs. So they're outside. They're in heavy equipment, typically alone. And so we've introduced protocols at those operations, particularly if they're 24-7 operations, to assure that areas are cleaned, equipment is new, and everything is in the condition that it needs to be. In corporate offices, it's been very different. So here at our corporate headquarters, we may have several hundred people here on a typical day, we probably have 10% of that here today. So we, we, we've operated in a, in a very remote way. And what I'll tell you is, if someone had told us that we could have done this and done it this effectively, honestly, I would not have believed it. Our systems have held up extraordinarily well. So I'd, I'd have to compliment two, two different groups. One, our employees are being so resilient. And number two, the people in our, our information systems who have made so much of that happen. So. It's much like doing this conversation that we're having today. Um, you know, we'd much rather be in the studio together, but we're going to come through this and, and have a conversation that works just fine. And that's what we've seen in our business as well. Randall? Ward, we're fortunate to have a good number of Fortune 500 companies in North Carolina, including uh, those with headquarters. And uh, thank you for Mark Marietta's uh, being here as well. What makes North Carolina so attractive for your headquarters? And are there things that we can do as a state to attract other headquarters to our state? Well, as I like to tell people, Randall, I'm a North Carolinian by birth, education, and inclination. So it's, so it's easy from my perspective. Right. But I think part of what makes it easy is if we look at population trends in the state all by itself. Over the last decade, our population went up nearly 20%. If we look at 10.4 million people who live in North Carolina today, and if we believe the people who keep these statistics, by 2040, we'll have another, we'll have 13 million people in our state. A lot of people see the reasons to come here. I think the fact is we have a friendly business environment. We have a tax structure here that is attractive to people. We also have a climate here that's attractive. I think if we look at the, at the initiatives that we've seen from the governor's office, from the legislature and others, assuring that we have good creation of jobs and an attractive structure going forward is so important. Part of what we heard from Chris at the beginning is I'm chair of the North Carolina Chamber this year. And if we look at what their pillars are, we, we look at education and we recognize that that's critically important. We look at a competitive business environment and we recognize that's critically important. And we're also looking at infrastructure. And if we really look at what pillars are to make sure that this state is number one, attractive today, but I think equally important, attractive long-term. It's the type of emphasis in those areas that we think makes a big difference. And I think they have made a big difference for us. Ward, let, let me un unpack something for you again. So for our audience in North and South Carolina, DOT is a major influencer. It's of course, as you well know, Department of Transportation because of your membership on NC First is a $5 billion or so budget per annum. In South Carolina, it's, it's around three, a little bit less, but nonetheless, both the Carolinas are very, in, uh, very invested in transportation. How do you make the argument to the General Assemblies or to those that control some public purse monies that DOT 
maybe not should be placed over education, but given a year when educational attainment is a challenge and our new normal, whatever that looks like in public education is being challenged, how do you co compare and contrast transportation and education? You know, it was, it was interesting, I'll tell you, we, we've seen some recent survey data, Chris, that speaks directly to that. At least in North Carolina, my guess is numbers would be very similar in South Carolina. In some recent surveys, healthcare and transportation actually tied as far as what people are most focused on right now. And my comment was, those are the types of numbers we're seeing in a pandemic. So I think if we're seeing that in a period of time where healthcare and everything around it is so top of mind, to recognize that transportation is that top of mind in that environment, we think is actually quite powerful and, and underscores the importance of it. The other thing that I think is so important, and we've got good data that reveals this, if we go and look at roads or highways and streets that have been upgraded recently in the Carolinas, and then we look at economic development that has come behind those levels of upgrades, they're outperforming other parts of the state by 15, 16, sometimes 20%. So what we're seeing is the investment that we put in infrastructure today, whether it's in jobs, maintaining jobs, creating new jobs, state domestic product or otherwise, are really very powerful. And what we recognize too is North Carolina is blessed with many things. We've got a great port system, we have a rail system, and we have a tremendous surface transportation system. Many states don't have that, but something that's different at least here in, in the northern part of, of the North, North and South Carolina is NCDOT maintains more state miles than any other state except for Texas. And then if we go and look at what we're investing on a per mile basis compared to states like Texas and Florida, what you'll find is we're considerably behind, but equally, if you look at our population inflows, and I think that's how we need to think of it, uh, we're going to continue to see a wave of people come into the state. Now, granted, that's a high-class problem, but nonetheless, it is something that we're going to have to be very thoughtful about. All right, Joe. Yeah, Ward, you, I want to come back to something you said just a few minutes ago about maintaining a long-term competitiveness for, for North Carolina and South Carolina, too. I'm just curious, as our attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter, how do you, both in your business and, and what encouragement would you offer to politicians as we approach an election, how do you think we should cultivate some real long-term thinking about in this policy environment and economic environment? I think in some respects, we're going to have to continue to make it personal for people because they have to recognize that something that they don't think about a lot, and that is transportation and mobility is something that is absolutely key and critical, not just to their business lives, but to their way of life. So I think if we can continue to have that conversation and again, make it personal, I think that that matters. I think the other thing that people will recognize is transportation is changing and it's changing very, very quickly. What's likely to happen, Joe, is we will see transportation change more in North Carolina and the, the U.S. over the next 10 or 15 years than we have over the the course, course of a century, because we're going to see electric vehicles and hybrids and others simply become more ubiquitous. And if we remember that most of the way that we invest in highways, bridges, roads, and streets, not just in North Carolina, but across the nation, is utilizing a gas tax, that's going to be tough to make that math work going forward. And if we look at other states that haven't been visionary on the way that they're going to deal with transportation, we can find that quality of life has genuinely suffered pretty considerably. So I, I think if we recognize that these are in fact personal issues, they're going to affect you, they're going to affect your children, they're going to affect your workplace, and they're going to affect everything about your life, including how efficiently you get food, services, and otherwise, suddenly they'll care and they'll recognize this is something that matters to me each day. We have literally have about a minute left. Randall, do you have a quick question for Ward? Uh, it would not be a quick question, probably. I was curious about your thoughts on the misalignment between talent and skills and job needs, uh, job availability now and into the future. Is that something you'd like to comment on briefly uh, on behalf of the chamber or, or your own work? No, it is. And, and obviously, it's, it's one of the three pillars that the chamber has. And, and we're focused on education in the state. Part of what we have to remember too is we have one of the great community college systems in any state here in North Carolina. 
And if we look at the way community colleges have worked here over time, their population goes up when the economy gets worse and their population goes down when the economy gets better. Our ability to utilize not just our high schools, not just our university system, but our community college system to make sure that we have people ready and trained for the jobs of the future is going to be critically important. And we have a foundation there that I think we can really leverage. And, and Peter Hans left that system in great shape. He's off to the University yes. of North Carolina system to, to do great things there. But doing something to make sure we've got a nice nexus between those two can be awfully important. Ward, I wish we had more time. We literally have less than a half a minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, just in about five minutes, IBM, Cisco, Wells Fargo, all talking about major layoffs. Would you expect to see more of those in the future? I think we'll see those in some sectors, okay. uh, but I think in other sectors, we won't. We, we've been very fortunate in, in ours. We haven't seen much of that. Okay. And, and all right. I so love the fact that this business is very resilient but I do think we will see some of those if we can't get the economy more opened up safely soon. Okay, that well done on a tough question. Ward, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your leadership. Randall, Joe, good to see you both. Until next week, Thanks, Chris. I'm Chris William, good night. Thank you. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.